Good Monday afternoon to those of you who are watching us on Tales of the Kingdom, Stories of the Kingdom, or you can say it a number of different ways, but on, on this radio program, every Monday afternoon, we try to uh, help people understand from stories how they can be the hands and feet of Jesus, because that's the story of the kingdom. As we become kingdom people and Jesus lives in us, we make ourselves available for our hands and feet to be his and for him to work through us in order to demonstrate his great love to others who may not know him, who may know him, who may have heard about him but are, are not sure who he is. Like Jesus did with his initial disciples, he invited them to follow him before they knew him. And they weren't converted when he began to disciple them. He discipled them, and as they came to know him, they believed in him. And that's what the stories of the kingdom is about. And today we have Neil Montgomery from Scottsdale Bible Church with us. And uh, we're delighted to have you with us, Neil. And, uh, and my co-host, Julian Gibb, is going to take the leadership on the interview because uh, he and Neil know each other. And, uh, and Neil and I are acquainted with each other, but don't know each other as well as Julian does. So, Julian, take it. Hey. Well, Neil, thanks for joining us. Well, I'm glad I could be here. So Neil, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and your role at uh, Scottsdale Bible Church. Well, you know, my favorite topic is me, so that's always a good thing to talk about. <laughs> now, it is, and I, and I know our time is limited here, but I've been at uh, Scottsdale Bible Church for the last seven plus years. Uh, we, uh, I've been in ministry now as a pastor, both an associate and a senior pastor for about 33 years. And uh, right now in a large church like Scottsdale Bible Church, your roles change, and uh, I've helped plant some of our multi-site campuses. I've helped with our core leadership team as an associate to our senior pastor. Um, one of the things I do is I make sure everybody in our congregation is cared for by a pastor, so congregational care. And uh, most recently, I've just uh, hired a couple of associates, and we are now the campus pastors for our largest campus, which is our, our worship center campus here on the Shea campus. Uh, we have a campus on Cactus Avenue and up north uh, called Northridge, and uh, we have plans to grow a few more. So God's really moving in this church, and I'm blessed and humbled to be a part of it. So, um, you know, I've been on your campus, and it, it's uh, it's beautiful. You know, I really love the uh, the worship center, and, uh, you know, you have uh, areas for the youth and for the kids, and, of course, I love the coffee shop. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but what there are many places in the phoenix metropolitan area that have uh jungle gyms and coffee shops and uh places so what, what's the difference with you guys i mean i mean uh, why why go to scottsdale bible church what, what is it that you're offering what is it that you're yeah. meeting people with yeah i mean sometimes with churches in america i think it was eugene peterson who called it the american uh christianity you know that we so commodified it that's the dangerous danger part of it and as churches grow which we all want to grow that's american of us and uh that's what we do in america julian we grow and uh people want more people and and i think as christians we want to see people come to know the lord that the danger comes when you cross that threshold and you forget are we selling pizza or are we about jesus and i I spent probably 25 of my 33 years of ministry in smaller churches because of that very thing. I, I think smaller churches were uh, wired better to be boots on the ground and larger churches seemed to swell and, and it was harder to be boots on the ground. All of a sudden you were taking care of logistics like buildings. We need maintenance people and housekeeping people and security staff and all of that. And, uh, but when I came to Scottsdale Bible Church, I thought, as far as big churches go, uh, this church gets it. I mean, number one, we have a pastor that is not what he would call a megalomaniac. He's not out writing books and doing the speaking circuit. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing, 
but oftentimes I think those pastors forget that they're shepherding a flock. And so I, I love what our pastor, Jamie Rasmussen, he leads us well. He doesn't forget his roots. And that's one reason I joined, and I feel like he shepherds us well. And then I think it's a church that has learned to, and this is probably overstated, grow larger by growing smaller. And uh, the, the Scottsdale Bible is a, a powerful small groups ministry. And then our global outreach team that Bob is a part of um, is reaching across the globe. So large churches have a, just a far reaching impact. But then we have uh, Shannon Cox is our local ministry director of local outreach. And we have many local ministries that people can get smaller by getting their hands dirty and being involved in those. So what to, what's the point? Of Scottsdale Bible Church. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, if, if I'm Jamie's a reductionist, I'm a reduction. At the end of the day, we just want to help people who don't know Jesus come to know Jesus. And Bob, I, I love the way you started. I love the image of being the hands and feet of Jesus. You know, in fact, it just gives me goosebumps when I think about that, because that's what we are. That's what we want to be. And, and so I think at the end of the day, you know, we've coined it in a, in a little catchphrase for our, our mission by saying we want to help people get God, get real, and get out there. Get God. We want them, just like those disciples, to come to a place where they recognize their need for God, a hope beyond the kingdom of this world. And just like Bob was saying, to focus on another kingdom, the kingdom of God. And uh, once they taste that and they get God, uh, we then want them to understand that life, and I love the way Larry Crabb, author Larry Crabb says this, we're to relate to God, get God, and then put that relationship on display in the way that we relate to one another. And so we want people to get real, get real with one another, learn to explore one another, to give a reason for the hope that lies within you. Do you remember that verse in First Peter, I think it's 3.15, where Peter said, you know, be ready in season out to give a, a reason for the hope that lies within you. I remember asking that to a, a group of men a number of years ago at a church I was a senior pastor at in California, and they looked at me like I must have had bad pizza last night. They were like, <laughs> what do you mean by that? And no one comes up and says, hey, Julian, hey, Bob, what, what's with the hope in you? Well, and the reason I, I said, well, could it be that maybe we just don't live compelling lives or mm -hmm. lives that mm -hmm. spark curiosity in people? And I'm not talking about legalism. I think that pushes people away from the church. Legalism mm -hmm. being defined as laws and trying to be perfect. So that, But an authentic life, that when people see you guys go through difficulty and trials, they might see you weep. They might see you drop to your knees. But then they're going, where are they going for their, their solution? And that's what the world needs to see. And so I really think that the secret sauce of our church is helping people get God, then get real with God and one another. And then I think the fruit of that is you can't help but get out there. Remember Peter and John and Acts when they said, stop talking about this. And they said, we can't stop talking about this. We are compelled by this. And, and when I see people get that excited about their faith, they just can't stop talking. And, and I think that's kind of what our hope is at our church. You know, do we have sinful people? Do we have insincere people? Do we have taker? Yeah, we have all that. But through it all, there's a thread, a remnant of people who genuinely get this. And, and that's our hope. Help people get God, get real, and, and get out there. Neil, what are some of the stories that you could uh, relate to us that you can think of at SBC, Scottsdale Bible Church, where people are encouraged and actually do become Jesus' hands and feet um, in their home, in their community, in their place of work, in school, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, what a great question. And, and a lot of times you don't get to see it. I mean, many people will come into this large auditorium and, right. and that's by design. We want people to come in and have the grace. We call it the grace, pace and space, you know, to come in and just have anonymity, but we don't want them to stay anonymous. And so I think all of our challenge is to, to get that funnel to go closer, to get to the point of saying, I don't want to be a selfish consumer. I want to be a water carrying contributor to what's going on here. Amen. And, um, and it's always a great joy, Bob, when you see people go, I get it. And, and, and the lights come on and, and they, and you see the spirit moving in their lives. Um, and a lot of times people, as soon as it happens, the enemy creeps in and makes them feel shame for their past. 
and as shepherds, we are we can come alongside people and say to them, do you, do you, you know, "Are you saying that 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 some of us have things that we are ashamed of?" Yeah, I think so, I, and I think that <laughs> the enemy uh, the enemy leverages that, and we and we're so happy to right. put ourselves in a penalty box and, and yes, feel like, well, exactly. yeah, it ministries for pastors, and I think if there's any mistake that we might have made as pastors, we've abdicated ministry to us. We've said, hey, you pay us, we'll do it for you. And I think it's creating avenues where people can go down. So uh, for example, uh, we just had a young man that uh, we would, I, I, my mentor and I meet at a Starbucks after we go running, well, jogging. No, we don't even jog. We just shuffle along as old guys. Okay. Now. All right. I was going <laughs> to say, if you're jogging, you're doing pretty good. <laughs> yeah, no, that was, that was so yesteryear. Okay. And, uh, a man had been observing our conversation and our lives. Long story short, is sitting at that place, that man saw, he said it like this, when you guys talk, you sparkle. And, and that oh, was a real, I think wow. a real compliment. And he said, I want, I want the coffee you're drinking. <laughs> the man <laughs> prays to receive Jesus Christ. And now we have the opportunity every week just to meet with them. And, but to watch that, that growth take place, that seed sprout, and it's a work of the Holy Spirit, not us. I feel like we're hanging on watching stories like that. And, and, he, and then he's, he's coming to church every week, and, he's, and now he and his wife come, and they're like, we want to be involved. And they're exploring what their spiritual gifts are, what their heart and passions are, their abilities, personality, experiences, and so on, saying, and, how can and, we now and, do kingdom and work? What, 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 and I think what you're saying is what brought them is what they saw. Amen to that. I mean, there's a lot people can see that chase him away. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. but he saw a difference. And then when he came, he saw that. And he is, he is just beautifully exploring what he can do. And, and this weekend, he picked up a packet to sponsor one of our kids in Tanzania. He uh, met with some of our securities. He's a retired police officer. and said, I'd love to help you with volunteer with security. Wow. Um, you know, there are other people who say, you know, I want to uh, I want to go on the mission field, and they travel across the mission field. Some people start ministries. They realize that they can take, I just got a note from a guy just before we got on right here who said, I felt like I, I was being called into ministry my whole life, and, and yet the enemy just made me feel like I wasn't doing ministry. And then just through his time here at this church and, and learning and, and the spirit moving, he said just this morning in this letter, I realize my life is ministry. And, and the will of God is what's in front of me. That to me is the lights coming on because everybody wants to go, give me the four things that I'm supposed to do. And, and yet the reality is when we experience God, we experience full surrender. We taste the freedom. We experience what real worship is. And then we start to notice there's a whole world of opportunity in our sphere of influence. So not sure. I mean, there's story after story that we don't have enough time to go in, but some of those are just beautiful. But I, in a minute, I would like to hear a few more things because, you know, it, it, they, they sound wonderful. And I did have a look on your website, you know, and there's uh, my story, you know, on there of our people's lives have been changed. <laughs> Excuse me. But, um, you know, there are many organizations in America that help people with marriages, that help people with um, uh, raising children, uh, that have food banks. What, what, so what, what's the difference between these wonderful secular organizations and uh, Scottsdale. I mean, to put it in your terminology, what's the secret sauce? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. I, I remember, uh, you know, a few years ago, I mean, our country loves social justice issues. I mean, we're in a politically crazy time and I don't want to go there right now, but, but we are. I mean, it's just where we're at. And, and people love, I think what I love out of that, Christians and unbelieving people all want to help. That they want to help solve the, 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 the water problems across the world. They want to help people uh, um, not be hungry anymore. And so we started all these philanthropic organizations to end that. And, and the, the, the problem is you might solve world hunger, but you're simply, uh, as one pastor said, still sending people to hell just with full bellies. And, and so for us, the secret sauce at the end of the day is that we hope that we're able to meet the the felt need they have or the immediate need in front of them so that we would earn the right to speak into their life the hope that they can have in Jesus. I think sometimes as church we've been guilty of what people have called the bait and switch. Hey, we're not going to feed you until you pray a sinner's prayer. And we just want to feed them regardless. 
And as the as they open up to go and ask that question, what is it about you? Why are you doing this? And we have the opportunity to say, we're doing this because one, we love you. We're called to love you. That's our whole MO in this life, not to go around and get as many game pieces for me. It's to love you. And we find joy in that. And we want to point you to the hope that we have in Christ and that you can have also. So it, in its simplest way, and I hope it's not overly simplifying it, that's our secret sauce. Let me, let me ask you a question, Neil. Um, sort of a theological question. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Well, come on. You're a pastor. You should be able to answer this. <laughs> I know everything. Okay, good. All right. So you can answer it. Okay, the question is, okay, if we knew that that person who had a need that we could meet would never respond to Jesus. Should we take the initiative to meet that need or not? Bob, what, that's such a great question. And I think so often uh, the answer to that is partly, and I'm not going to answer it fully. I'm sure many have better answers than I do. Is it, is it so often we put ourselves in the place of God and we say, well, I'm not going to give that $5 to that person in the street because they're going to use it to get drugs or I'm not going to help that person. And I think the answer is, is, is 2 Corinthians 4, 7, where Paul lays out the beautiful image of, of jars of clay that are broken vessels. We are broken vessels. We came to God broken. And so we're cracked. And the treasure in us, that light, the hope just blows out through those cracks and pours out in other people. And, and we don't direct where it goes. We have to, you know, we have the spirit in us. And so we have a little bit of discerning nudges that we get, you know, and I'll tell you a story. I, the, our senior pastor, and it, not a lot of people know this, he's a very, very generous man. And we, uh, we watch football every Sunday. We go through, we grab lunch on the way home. And he doesn't hesitate when he sees someone on the side of the road that needing help to pull over and give them money. And uh, I stopped him one time and said, why are you doing this? I mean, we have no idea where they're going to give that money and how they're going to use it. Probably for drugs. That's what I always say. And uh, he said, you know, the goal is not to direct how they use that money. The goal is for me to give up that money because it's not mine. <clears throat> and so um, do, do give us some more examples of how the Holy Spirit has operated through Scottsdale, you know, how individual lives have changed. You know, I'm looking for names or anything, but how, how has God transformed people at Camelback? Excuse me, Scottsdale. Well, he is transforming people at Camelback, too, at all our churches. Of hell, but he is. I mean, just knowing that God's at work in everybody's life, just it allows you to go, it's not my deal. I just need to keep being abiding in him in the vine, John 15. I need to be ready, First Peter 3, and then I need to go, Matthew 28, and I leave the results up to him. One of the most compelling examples of, of recent days is in a big church, so often I feel like where there were so many layers of move from, removed from the ground level. And that's why Bob, you know, I remember some of the stories that Bob told about the Dominican Republic and that whole baseball field, you know, and the guy that wanted to just buy baseball equipment. And Bob's like, no, 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 no. I want you to get to know the local pastor. I love that. And, and a few weeks ago, a number of our pastors were starting to feel the weight of, we're not getting out there. This COVID is keeping us from being able to get into the ground and be boots on the ground. And our global outreach pastor, you said don't mention names. His name is not, not, not. Um, <laughs> He grabbed about four of us pastors and he took us north of Gallup to the Navajo Nation. Many of you are aware of that. And right in our own backyard, uh, so many of these dear ones have no running water. They have no electricity, believe it or not. And we partnered with a local church there in a town just north of Thoreau, uh, New Mexico. And they had, you know, some of the CARES Act monies and some ministries have donated just truckloads of fresh vegetables and food and, and um, clothing and su school supplies and all sorts of things. And we had the privilege of going there. And these, this fabulous, beautiful people in this church brought all of their trucks and vans and cargo vans that could hardly run and loaded them down literally till the tires were on the wheel wells where they had to take some stuff out. And, and we then drove two and a half hours, excuse me, to a place uh, way out in the middle of nowhere with these beautiful, and on the way we got flat tires because their tires and their spare was bald, they put on. And it, there was just something beautiful about going 
And even though we just got to be the hands and feet of Jesus and giving a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. Now, no offense to our large church, but one pastor turned to me and said, we'd never be able to do this from our church parking lot because we would have to make sure everybody had a background check that all, they were members of the church and you have to wait for six months before they can serve and all their vehicles are, are checked by our, our certified mechanic and that we have all the resources passed through the various boards to make sure we're rightly applying the resources. That's not a bad thing. I think just in large churches, it becomes a logistical thing. But to go out in a place where they're like, we don't have the time to care or the, or the resources, was so sweet it was so beautiful and to see the joy they had in giving away these or being you know being uh conduits of, of what was given to them was so rich and so beautiful how how has the holy spirit surprised you uh in how he's operated through scottsdale or your affiliates or how, how has the holy spirit sort of surprised you or jolted you or said hey neil come on get out of the way you know, how has he surprised you? Oh, like so many times. I, you know, in a big church, we have, we have fabulous teaching here, as you know. We have a beautiful campus, as you've experienced. We have American Idol worship every weekend, and it is wonderful. It brings people, it, it, it impacts them, helps them taste and see God so that they can get God, get real and get out there. But uh, when we went out to this, just this Navajo Nation, there was a dear couple who were so quirky. And at the end of handing out all this food, they wanted to share their life story and they had no sound system, no slick sound system, no jumbo, you know, TV screen with all these beautiful pixels and no lighting and fog machines. And they had nothing They had, they had a microphone with a generator that, and it was, it was, you know, EQing out and echoing. And, and in the midst of that, they were trying to present the gospel. And in my mind, I'm like, no, 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 this sounds horrible. And, and uh, these people that you're not even making sense. And, and uh, I just, ah, uh, and I just rolled my eyes going, we could do this so much better if we threw money at, long story short, they, at the very end, they even went so far as, like I would say, just wrap it up and just pray. They said, <laughs> we would like you to, if you want to commit your life to Jesus Christ, we would love for you to stand and just let us know. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Eight people stood up and I was just floored with tears streaming down their faces just going, I get it. And I thought, I'm so, so shame on me. And uh, not, again, not that large churches have their place and all they, they're so powerful, but it was such a beautiful reminder that God's, God does the work. We might plant seeds, we might water, but God causes the growth, as Paul said in Acts. And so just time after time, it's story after story where God reminds me, it's not about you, Neil. You, your job is to be still. Your job is to abide. Uh, Galatians 5.22, it's the fruit of the, it's God's fruit, not mine. And when I'm abiding, I start to see peace and joy and patience and gentleness and kindness and self-control flow out of me in ways that, ways that do surprise me. So, so uh, earlier on, you said, you know, how it, it's not the pastor's job to do everything. You know, is, is that, is that uh, Neil being lazy? Or, uh, I mean, I mean, why, why, why bring the congregation in? Why, why encourage them to be involved in ministry? No, I, I just think it's laziness. Oh, right, good, good. Glad we no, got that. I, <laughs> you know, I think sometimes as pastors, we get excited because when you, and, and Bob and Julian, you know this better than I do, when you get to be the hands and feet of Jesus, there is a joy that I don't think anything on this, in this world can compare you know, philanthropic people love to get buildings named after them, you know, and they feel good about it and giving their money away. They're just getting a tax write off most of the time and, and they want to make sure their names on. The, but to go to a place where we went and then get just using that example, because I know our time is limited and, and to a place that people can never thank us in return. And then to be able to, to take what's not yours, the resource of your time and treasure and talent and touch it and share it with people and to see the response there's no, no, nothing on earth that can compare to that. And, and I think I go with Paul in Ephesians 4 again, that talks about our job as a church is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Amen. And Amen. so that's what our role is. Yeah. Neil, thank you so much for sharing uh, the kingdom and its stories from your perspective of 
as a pastor at Scottsdale Bible Church here in Phoenix, Arizona. We really appreciate that. Well, uh, thank, you, thank you, Bob. Yeah, Neil, could I ask you to close us uh, in prayer uh, and specifically asking the Holy Spirit to encourage those who have been listening and watching to have the Holy Spirit show them how today and this week they can be the hands and feet of Jesus. I'd love to do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, uh, I have no idea um, how you will use what we've just shared today, but I know that you, in your way, will lead some to tune in to what's being shared here. And, and Julian and Bob and I, by no means, are we experts in all of this. In fact, I'd argue that all three of us would say the more we grow, the more we realize we don't know. Mm. And Lord, I'm grateful that that keeps us humble. I'm grateful that that keeps us thirsty and it, that it's the thirst that keeps us dependent on you. It's a thirst that you said will never be quenched this side of heaven and that your presence is the only guarantee you give us in the Bible this side of heaven. And so what I pray for those who might be watching that maybe they are wondering, what do I do? I pray that they would rest in knowing that our to do is to abide in you Amen. and that they would hunger for your word to know that your word reveals not a list of commands and to do's for us, though they are in there, but more than anything, the word of God reveals a character of God, a living God, so that we can relate to you in such a real way and then put that on display in the way we live our lives. And Lord, for each person that's tuning in and listening, God, they have a sphere of influence. They have family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, that person at the gas station, the bank, the grocery store, that they are rubbing shoulders with every day. And we are called not to be in holy huddles and to circle our wagons, but we're called to rub off on the world. And that might just be giving a cup of coffee in Jesus' name to somebody. So Lord, I pray that you would encourage the listeners. I pray that you would stir up within them a hunger for you and that that would manifest itself in a power directed at reaching others who desperately need the hope in times like these. Thank you for Bob and Julian, and thank you for this uh, wonderful program. Would you use it and multiply it as you desire, and may you receive all the glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Neil. And for those of you who are watching, um, we encourage you, if you have stories to tell us, go to the Harvest website, harvestfoundation.org, under contact, and tell us your story. We'd love to learn. God bless you.